All right, let's get started, please. Um, I am going to be filing midterm grades later today. Sorry for the delay. Um, I'll be contacting some of you personally about your grades. In some cases, to say congratulations on fine work. Uh, in unfortunately more cases, to ask what's going wrong. Um, but one thing I do want you to understand is that most of the work of the course in terms of evaluation is yet to be done. You have a short paper coming up, you have a long paper coming up, and you have the final exam. Now, I think by my calculation, roughly speaking, the exams in this course count a total of about 35%, right? 15% for the midterm and 20% for the final. That's because at NYU, final exams don't last that much longer than midterms as opposed to other places where there's a big, where the final is sometimes three times longer. So in those places, the final counts like 50% of your grade. Here it's about 20. But I'll make you this deal. If you improve your grade on the final exam, I will drop the, how much that midterm uh, grade counted down to about 5%. So it'll count, the final will count a lot more. And if you absolutely blow away your performance, I mean, if you do so much better on the final exam than you did on the midterm, so say you get an A on the final having gotten a D on the midterm, I will simply think that you had a bad day at the midterm exam and discount it entirely. Or even more, even better perhaps, I will think that you adopted a kind of Franklinian perspective, <laughs> identified your errata and fixed them. Okay, so you have significant and significant um, incentive now not to despair. This is not Calvinist depravity we're talking about, at least not in the cases of most of you. Um, not to despair and start to mail it in just because your final, your midterm grade isn't what you and I had hoped it would be. No, this is the time to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and um, do better. Okay, we are looking to reward upward progression. We are looking to espouse perfectionism rather than the idea that we're all doomed and depraved. So I want you to take that seriously, all right? Uh, but there are, in certain cases, I will be asking you to come in to see me because um, there are certain levels of performance where I think that something, there's a crucial thing that's missing in the way that you're approaching your work. I don't actually care if you've been blowing off, if you tell me, look, you know, sorry, I just had a play that I was in and I just blew off your course. I will actually not worry about you as much because you're making a choice. And you're allowed to make a choice, right? You can choose to not do well in this course. That's fine. Um, I'm more concerned with people who expected to be doing better and who haven't, don't know why things aren't working out either on the papers or the exams, right? If you find that I have not contacted you, but you feel, still feel like you're in that uh, boat, like you got a B minus and you really thought you were going to get an A minus or an A, then come and see either me or your TA, right? And we can talk to you about I think in, in many cases it's about fixing the, your, your strategies of, of reading and understanding what's going on in the text. All right, any questions about that? Uh, paper assignment will go out by email tonight. Uh, and remember, it's due not Friday, but a week from Friday. Very soon, I, and I think actually I'm just going to put the prompt for the final paper on there as well so you can start thinking about it. You should think about the final paper basically as an attempt to build on what you've been doing in the earlier two papers. Think of those as kind of building blocks. As the final paper might be two or three put together pieces of analysis like the ones that you've been doing, but assembled into a kind of larger argument. Uh, in this case, an argument that you will propose to us. Okay, so we're going to ask you for topic statements. We'll take a quick look at them and let you know if you're on the right track or the wrong track. And when you do those topic statements, we'll be asking you not only to give us a sort of hypothesis about what you think you'll argue, but also give us a kind of catalog, appropriate in talking about Whitman to be mentioning catalogs, a catalog of th evidence that seems to you likely to be important to you. And in general, we would like you to find more evidence than you can possibly use. We'll ask you for a few things, but I mean, you should be in the position of needing to pick the best evidence to make the case that you want to make, and not simply feeling that you need to use every single thing that you thought of, OK? So um, you can talk about those things in section this week. All right, um, Whitman. Let's look at some more Whitman. Uh, let's turn to the beginning of Song of Myself, actually. This is on 2210 of the <laughs> anthology. And then we'll move on to talk a little bit about um, Emerson and think about the, what I suggested before, about the ways in which 
that we might want to temper our optimism about transcendentalism now as we approach the unit of the course that's really devoted to slavery. All right. So Song of Myself, which is given the title late, later in its career, um, begins this way. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And I just want to stop and pause and think about those three lines a little bit more closely and think about the ways in which they may or may not um, encapsulate Whitman's project in Song of Myself and in his writing as a whole. I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume, you shall assume. For every long atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I mean, you can think about there's any number of ways to say this. One's gone around and had people, you know, different people in the class say it in different ways. And I want to know what's at stake in saying it in one or more of those particular ways. So, um, somebody, tell me where you would place the stresses on those words if you were the one up here reading it aloud. I'm going to close the door while you think for a moment. Anyone want to volunteer? Because I do have the attendance sheet still up here, and I can call on people. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I want so say it out loud. So I celebrate myself and sing myself. Okay. But um, I think that I, I don't know. I guess drawing on. Um, so you would say I celebrate myself and sing myself. Mm -hmm. And what does that do? I feel like if Whitman is trying to draw on past poets and past poets always speaking about God, then he's kind of. He's borrowing this, self, like I guess, the the, the theme of self divinity. Okay. And he's trying. Um, yeah. I think so self divinity, thinking about someone in contrast to somebody like Edward Taylor, for example, also formally experimented, but would not say, "I celebrate myself and sing myself." He says. He starts, says things like, I am this humble crumb of dust. I am this minuscule speck that you should walk on. I mean, right? This is quite different from that. And he's not as humble towards, I guess, if he was going to try, if he was going to, try to mention a higher being, he's not so humble in this opening line. Okay. He's kind of, I don't know, he's kind of placing himself on a, on a pedestal. Okay, so he's not humble. Who, would we tie that to anybody else that we've read? I mean... Where's this coming from? Yeah. Rowe. To who? Rowe. Thoreau. How so? Um, there's a difference between equalism and <coughs> self-reliance You mean Thoreau or Emerson? You could mean both. I mean both. Okay. Right, because I think Thoreau is right. I mean, Thoreau is interested in himself and in his particular observations. It's Emerson that says all mean egotism vanishes in that moment, right? Although he is trying to talk about uh, a connection between himself. But it's interesting, again, to note that phrase in Emerson. It's not that all egotism vanishes and I become like Taylor, this crumb of dust and the speck, this particle am amongst the divine current. We keep a certain amount of egotism. A certain amount of egotism is necessary for self-reliance. It's the mean egotism that we want to get at. Right, so you almost there's a sense of an egotism. There's a kind of a way of being um, self-reliant or, if you want, egotistical that nevertheless has a kind of outward flow to it. Maybe that's part of what Emerson, um, Whitman is picking up from Emerson. Yeah. Okay, so let's, we could think about that dynamic as well. I mean, there could be, I am so, you could say that I'm, if you celebrate, if you stress myself, you are, he's celebrating himself, but there is a sense of being by myself, right, while you're celebrating. And it might be that if you don't want that, you might choose another, I celebrate myself and sing myself, like not with other people. He doesn't play nicely with the other children. I 
I mean, I think that's very good. I think there's a tension in the poem between those different visions of what it means to celebrate yourself. Right? There's a sense in which he is doing something that is quite different, if we think about it, from the kind of some of the past histories of poetic forms. He's not afraid to put himself front and center. Right? I mean, if you think about the, the progression of forms that we've looked at, I mean, Puritan poetry is supposed to be about venerating God. Public poetry in the Revolution era is supposed to be about ver venerating your country or celebrating the lives of famous people. It's not supposed to be about the self. We start to move to lyric experience when we get to somebody like Bryant, right? But even then, Bryant is describing, is creating a somewhat idiosyncratic voice, but really stressing a kind of communal theme. And this, this kind of, this uh, commun the, the, the voice becomes quietly idiosyncratic. It's not upfront about itself, right? It's, it's meant to be idiosyncratic in a way of making its kind of connection. It's meant to be a more personal kind of voice than you might say the impersonal marching rhythm that you will find in so much neoclassical poetry. And it's meant to make a connection to the reader on the subject of death. It's a meditation on death. This is a meditation on life in all of its fullness and messiness, right? And part of what, his, what he does is he celebrates himself. But I think there is a tension. Is he alone doing this? Right? Emerson talks about needing somebody with a tyrannous eye. Well, maybe it's a kind of lonely place to be if you're going to have that tyrannous eye. What about the second line? What I assume you shall assume. Yeah. Um, that was a little difficult because when I first read it, I, like, my brain puts the comma after assume, even though there isn't one. So it comes off as a fairly like, demanding, like what I assume you shall assume. Mm -hmm. but I don't tend to read it that way, but I think that's probable. I mean, it's possible. What I assume you shall assume. What I assume you shall assume. He's assuming that they will say that three times. One time. Okay. <coughs> it's I mean, I, w I would say that's right. The, 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 the lack of a comma does make it possible to think of you shall assume as the object of the verb, what I assume you shall assume. It's hard to get a grasp because there isn't a rhythm since it is free verse. Okay. How else might we think about that? Yeah. Well, I guess this is a kind of a different point, but at first, the first when I heard this, I, um, it seemed kind of like it didn't quite match because <coughs> celebrating and singing aren't necessarily like interpretive or analytical, and then like every atom belonging to me is good belongs to you is very material, and it doesn't really have much to do with like assumptions as as I don't know. I think there are two ways that you can. And maybe I'm wrong. With, I was going to look up the definition of assume, but I didn't. Because it seems like he could also be, rather than using the verb. Well, what, what, okay, let's think about assume. What might assume mean? Yeah. Does it mean to like assume as in making an assumption or like making uh, like an approximation that people kind of use assume now, but it could also mean to like assume a form? Okay, that's good. So what we take for granted, what I assume, but what I take up, what I bear, I assume your burden. <laughs> What I assume, you shall assume. My poetic project shall be yours. Yeah? I think you have to read that line directly with the one from Self Alliance where Emerson says, um, to believe your own thought, to believe what is true for you and your private part is true for all men, that is genius. Mm -hmm. Or he also brings up the same point in nature, um, chapter five, every universal truth which we express in words implies or supposes every other truth. That's good. I mean, I think you, the one way to think about it is it's a, it's a poetic restatement of precisely those insights from Emerson. That there's a kind of, there's something universal about our nature, right? Emerson says most people are afraid to speak out. They don't raise their hands in section, and then they find that somebody else said exactly what they were going to say and maybe didn't even say it quite so well, right? Our own thoughts return to us, he says, with a certain kind of alienated majesty. So I think that's right. There's a way in which Whitman is plugging right into that idea. Anybody get bothered by this? Feel like it was a little bit pushy? <laughs> what I assume, you shall assume? I, I don't read it that way. I, I also read it um, as assuming as in taking on, but not necessarily taking on form. I feel like the first stanza here is, is his mission overall. Like, you think about the way the rest of the poem falls out with all the, you know, the visual stimulus that he just keeps picking on. I think it's his mission of, of almost removing the shame from subjectivity. Mm -hmm. It's like if this is the universal element that we all have. It's like it's an awareness of self as representation, almost like 
like Franklin. You know, he's talking about every atom of me belongs to you because we all perceive. That's just what it seems to me. That Why as good? As good. What does it mean? For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. It's well, kind of that's the universal principle that he's arguing. He's using, like, his poetic mission then is to use, you know, all these images to necessarily represent, like, to represent these qualities as in, like, everyone's, everyone's experience is just as good. There's no lesser quality, like, which is why he argues the, the essential unity of everything. Okay, that's good. I think that's right. I mean, I think there's, there's a way in which what he's arguing is that in some sense we're consubstantial. Right? I mean, it can seem a little pushy or even imperialistic, if you will, to say, what I assume, you shall assume. It's like, you don't have a choice, reader. I am you know, making meaning and you're going to take it up. But then it's qualified. Why does he say that? For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. That's, that's a statement about consubstantiality or, and maybe even contingency or chance. The atoms that are in me, quite literally, could be in you. They are, we're all made of the same stuff. Did you want to add something? Uh, yeah. Um, another kind of way that I was looking at it is kind of an acknowledgement of like the relationship between the writer and the reader. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, as I go along, you're following me, what I assume you're going to read it and you're going to assume it as well. Because there's all these like kind of conscious questions that he asks his question throughout the poem. And there's other lines that kind of point to yeah, I mean, I've talked to you about the ways in which I think we ought to think of text as collaborations between writers and readers, right? And so there's a sense in which we'd suggest that the, the meaning of a text doesn't exist until somebody takes it up and reads it or speaks it and engages with the author and constructs that meaning. People that, are, that uh, find themselves a little perturbed by this think that, that there's a certain way in which, if that's true, Whitman is taking up a lot of the oxygen in the room, right? That he's taking up... He's not leaving a lot of room for you in there. That, that, that some people would argue that there's a kind of perfunctoriness to the way in which he constructs a you. That really it's just all, one of these people who just talks at you without leaving you much space to do your own constructing. I just want you to bear, and I'm not saying that that's what I, th I think you should believe or even what I believe, but there are people that, that read this and find it a little bit disturbing. And that would be the basis of, of arguing that there's something that should disturb us about Whitman's poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Explain the world. He's kind of saying like he's going to be the instrument to explain the world. Okay, that's good. Making a representation, like using himself. So then there's a kind of funny split, right? I mean, it, I suggested to you that that maybe Emerson and Thoreau finally are using nature instrumentally, right? It's an object for them, something that gets them someplace. It's funny then to be Whitman. If you're using your body and yourself in that same way, you're sort of objectifying yourself, or you're even you're containing within you that kind of subject-object split that Descartes writes about. So that there's a certain way in which he maintains his subjectivity, but part of the way in which he constructs himself as a subject is to construct himself as an object. But remember, that's, that shouldn't actually seem very strange. It's, again, as I pointed out to you before, it's a strategy of personal narrative. Right? I mean, what does Franklin do in order to write his autobiography? He has to transform himself into two things. One is Franklin author. And what does Franklin author write about? Franklin author writes about this thing called Franklin character. So that there's a sense in which Franklin has to objectify his own life in order to, to settle it down and turn it into a a story and talk about himself, even if he talks himself in the third per first person, there's almost a sense that he's constructed a kind of third person version of himself. So that's one of the things I think that, that Whitman's poetry brings out. I mean, th in that sense, it really is a kind of personal narrative. Anybody else find yourselves disturbed by assume or anything that goes with it? Yeah. Good. So I think that's right. I mean, he's in some sense establishing the premise, right? It is going to be, he's going to have his cake and eat it too. It's going to be about himself, but it's also going to be about everyone else. And there's certain ways in which he's trying to establish that ground. I just want to point out to you that there's a certain kind of materiality here to what he's talking about, right? I mean, Emerson would maybe um, use 
in these first three lines, the word that Whitman reserves for the fourth line, which is the word soul, right? I mean, Emerson thinks that what connects all of us together and what connects us to uh, the divine is the idea that we have this divine soul. Whitman wants to make that a little more problematic because he thinks that that gives short shrift to something that he thinks of as very important or integral to himself, namely the body. So the first way, in, you might say the first way in which he asserts our commonality is not by going the soul route, but rather the body route, by just talking literally about atoms. We are all made of the same matter and stuff. You might say that's his first premise. He's going to get to the soul. And then he's going to make the whole question of the soul problematic by suggesting that the soul is something with which he is in dialogue. We get that in the fourth line, right? I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass, which would suggest to us that the soul is somehow not part of the eye, or there's some part of the eye that's not including the soul, or, you know, just, it's, a, it's an odd locution. And you should think of it in relation to Emerson. This is one way in which fundamentally he's kind of deviating from Emerson. Emerson thinks that who you are is your soul. Everything else is contingent, right? Everything else, even your own body, belongs to that not me. There's a certain way in which Whitman is turning it around, at least for the start, and relegating the soul to the not me, at least in terms of the subjectivity of the poem as it's first, um, as it's first laid out here. Did you, have a, did you want to say something there? Well, I mean, I think, you know, once you start to pull these lines apart, they start to become, they start to mean not exactly only what you thought they meant, right? Every atom is long, belonging to me as good belongs to you. I mean, it just is, might as well belong to you, or it could be. But then if you start to think about it, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, I mean, is, that would seem a little artificial, but is it excluded? The idea of, you know, he doesn't say might as well belong to you. He sticks that word good in there, which creates certain kinds of syntactical resonances. Right? I mean, that's part of what we have to look at. I mean, I was just talking, talking in office hours today to somebody who's completely, he's an econ economics person in one of my other classes, completely baffled by the reading of poetry. So I started to talk to him about the way, I mean, if you come to Whitman without thinking about some of the other stuff that we've been thinking about, it can look baffling. You might not understand why is it that this is poetry and not prose. What if you just you know, ran it all together, wouldn't it look like a piece of prose? And maybe you could do that. Not all of it would work that way. But I think part of what we need to understand is the way that Whitman is trying to express something that, as Emerson says, expresses the kind of, that encapsulates the entire country, the experience of the country. He's trying to get it all down on paper, you might say. So that forces him to explode previous forms. He wants to say, you know, like, all the other poets have not done a good job of capturing what is distinctive about the United States. Some of them complain that it's an unpoetical country. Some of them are just, you know, flabbergasted by everything that they see. Emerson says the same thing. He says, we, we, we are looking for the poet. Where's the poet? Part of the problem, as he suggested in the American scholars, is that we're too sycophantic when it comes to Europe. We've listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. Well, we don't have courts. We don't have, like, you know, king's courts here. We have law courts, but we have other kinds of things. We have other forms, and Emerson wants to say that those are poetical. Banks and tariffs and business and all this other stuff is part of the poetry of this country. Whitman understands that as well. Right? So part of what he's doing, as you might say, is exploding previous forms. But once you start to l understand that and realize, the, I think I, I really do want to stress something that I said almost as a throwaway last time, and I think it's really true. When we look at every other poet that we've looked at up until now, we're interested in what they do with metrical feet. Right, we think about how long their lines are. Are they pentameter lines or tetrameter lines? Was it anapestic tetrameter as in key? Or was it you know, iambic pentameter as in Wheatley? Or what is it that Taylor is doing to these things? And how come it doesn't scan so well? Ask yourself about scanning Whitman. What would it mean to scan a line of Whitman? What would it get you? If I asked you to do a close reading of Whitman, which of the, I mean, I sort of said, okay, before, like do a kind of checklist, look for stanzaic form, look for rhyme scheme, look for meter. Are those things going to be of use to you when you're reading Whitman? Maybe not. 
So what is going to be of use to you? Maybe some of the other things that we were looking for, larger rhetorical form. Right? And also, moments when you can just isolate the fact that certain words are placed in kind of ambiguous relation to one another. So that there's a kind of ebb and flow of the line in which almost even in a line it seems to shift its meaning, depending on how you read it. I mean, I think that's one of the things to understand about Whitman. The poetry is designed in some, I mean, his metaphor is the leaf of grass, right? But the poetry in some sense is designed to mimic water. It ebbs and flows. It has big bursting places and then times when it's quiet. And he does, there is a lot of you know, imagery of water and rivers and other kinds of things going on in the poetry. Right? So it has different styles and they're all encompassed in this one. So part of what I think you need to do when you're reading this poetry to really get inside it is to think about the larger project, think about how he got here from where other people were. I mean, why is this not, why would you, if we put this on the exam, you'll know it, right? You're not gonna mistake this one. Oh, by the way, I should mention, in terms of knowing it, we, there will be passages on the final, but being able to ID them is no longer the point, right? Because it's very distinctive. I mean, all of these writers are, uh, except for possibly where we could seek to confuse you between Emerson and Thoreau and promise you we won't do that. <laughs> so Whitman is very distinctive, right? In some sense, in this part of the course, he is by himself as the poet. And in some sense, we want to say he is both summing up a poetic tradition and also contradicting it. And that's a way that a lot of poetic traditions work. Poets often repudiate what's gone right before, sometimes trying to create something new, but sometimes openly looking back to earlier forms. You might want to think, is, is Whitman only repudiating what's gone before, or is there any way in which he's looking back to something? Can you think of any other poetic forms that you know about, not necessarily just from within the confines of our syllabus, that Whitman might be invoking in his poetry? Yeah, Nandini. Well, free, yes, free verse is what he's doing, all right? I mean, there's a sense in which free verse is part of what Whitman is helping to create. Poetry in the United States doesn't look the same after Whitman, in part because he becomes, he creates this thing that's called free verse. So that's of the moment. But within the free verse, you might, I guess what I'm trying to point out is to you that is it looks like free verse. And you could just say, well, anything goes. In the same way that people who look at modern art think, you know, my three-year-old sister could have done that one. Oh, what does it take to just draw a bunch of lines? Or what, was that, what does that mean, that painting that's just purely white? Right? But it means something different if you look at it just as an object than if you look at it as the last in a series of objects to which it referred and which it contextualizes itself. You know, I think both of them, to a certain extent, both of them are valid responses. I see a white painting on the wall. Looks like a white painting on the wall, okay. But then if I see that it has a title and refers back to something else, I get another response. And if I know things about the things to which it refers, I have perhaps a richer meaning that I am able to construct. Don't think the first meaning is wrong. It's just not as complex. Just like if you're reading Moby Dick and you don't know that the book called The Bible exists, your meaning is going to be a little bit less rich than somebody who does know that a book like the Bible is called The Bible Exists. And it's going to be a little bit less rich than somebody who actually knows what's in the Bible and can get all the little dirty jokes that Melville has implanted when he, because he doesn't believe that people are actually going to go look stuff up. So, okay, let's talk a little bit. Other forms that, that are invoked? Yeah. Um, uh, version sure, why not? Why, why not? Why not? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I sing of arms and the man. Interestingly, he's talking about himself, but yeah, why not? Sure. We could even do that. Yes, I would say that isn't that necessarily, that's probably not the first thing you thought of though, right? When you read it? Is it the first thing you thought of? I mean, it could be. Okay, good. That's fine. I think that if it weren't the first thing that you thought of, it might be something that you would think of later as you start to realize what's going on in the poem. I mean, you know, you could think of it first, I think if you say, okay, we know this is a big poem, it's meant to encapsulate an entire culture, and gee, isn't that exactly what the form of epic does? <coughs> epic is means, to, means to encapsulate something about a culture. Now, Virgil is really different, right? I mean, there's a sense in which Virgil is kind of narrative. It's full of inset stories, but it's pushing a particular narrative together. It's about, the need is about, you know, you find yourself in the middle of a story, but the story really begins with the sack of Troy and then moving forward to um, eventually found what's going to turn out to be Rome, right? So there's a kind of narrative, but it's a national thing. 
Whitman is doing a national thing too. So I think one of the things we would say is that Whitman is trying, one of the things he's trying to do, one of the ways in which he's looking to older poetic forms is he's leapfrogging all of these forms and if he finds an American example, it's not going to be one that's to his taste, right? I mean, if he, if he even knew Barlow's Dunciad, it's exactly the kind of poetry that he would not be wanting to write. But he would want to write an epic that in some sense is a new world epic, not a sycophantic neoclassical version of an epic, right? So yes, there's probably a, an echo of Arma Warumqua Cano in these lines. But think about the cataloging that goes on inside the poem all of those different catalogs of uh, things that he sees, people that he sees, right? It's a little le less remark remarkable in Virgil, although Virgil does it as an echo of Homer, but there's all this epic, epic, epic cataloging that goes on in the classical epics by Homer and Virgil, right? I mean, that's part of the technique, is to show you who's out there on the battlefield, what they're wearing, just a catalog of stuff. And that's one of the ways in which epic seeks to get its entire culture into the poem. So I think one of the things that we would immediately say is that what Whitman is doing is signaling a kind of democratic project, but it's a project that has certain reference points. An epic would certainly be one of them, right? Both Homeric, I would suggest, and Virgilian. Anything else? Are there any other constraints that we might find that Whitman is trying to put on himself? Yeah. Okay. I get the, like you said before, the motions of water and their risings and swells and um, the use of anaphora and punctuation, I think, establish like, pace in mm -hmm. ways. I think you're absolutely right. Music is one of the things that Whitman is trying to do to, to, to rethink his project. I mean, he was a big fan of the opera, right? And then you would say there's something operatic about what Whitman is trying to do in terms of big gestures. There's almost like it has the structure of an op opera where we have moments that are big, showy set pieces, right? The kind of opera that he would have been listening to in the middle of the 19th century. Just, you know, it's not quite going to be Wagnerian. It's going to be something else. More like, you know, operas that have kind of set pieces and then moments of recitative. I mean, that's definitely a model that he's using, right? So you, you have a kind of different moments in this, in this thing where you have certain cataloging moments those are, on the one hand, maybe epic. On the other hand, they may function as a kind of recitative. You have other kind of very lyrical and loud moments, other lyrical soft moments. Right? You have moments of narrative, dynamic things that are going on. All these are part of whatever metaphor you want to use as part of the ebb and flow of it or it's different kinds of set pieces within a, in a larger poem that tries to do something beyond what literary normally does. Epic invocation is one of them. Music is definitely another one. That's very good. Thanks to both of you. Anything else that we want to say about this? Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that the note says that um, there was no stanzas or sections at first um, upon first publication. So it's almost like he put these constraints on himself after he had written the poem. Like maybe he attempted it some shape for the new world, like structure. I think that's very. Uh, it's hard to know exactly why he breaks it up into these set stanzas. If you were going to go and compare, I mean, I showed you one little moment, right, where the, the word Manhattan is interpolated into this version of it. But yeah, there is a sense that one of the things he does is he, he possibly reins in his verse a little bit. He makes it look a little bit more conventional. He takes out some of the phrasing that, that um, is a little bit, I don't know what, marked by youthful exuberance is what people think. I mean, I already told you about the scholar that writes a, a gay life of Whitman, and in order to find the poems that, that illustrate that, he has to go to kind of not even, not this one, sort of the versions before this. So there's a certain way in which Whitman himself is editing his own canon. That's one of the things that's kind of remarkable about him as a poet. He takes this set of poems, enlarges it over his career, but it keeps working on them. A little bit like George Lucas, yes. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's very another good thing. I mean, we're, we've talked a little bit in, in when we remember Melville earlier in the course. We'll come back to it again. But Melville thought of himself as having kind of Shakespearean ambitions. And I think, you know, Whitman doesn't tend to talk about Shakespeare as often, but certainly there is something dramatic. I mean, Whitman was a fan of the theater. And he used to go, and when he was young, he went to the old Bowery Theater right down there, the working class theater. He writes about it later on, as if it's you know, kind of romanticized all those young, muscly men on the, 
on stage and everybody kind of, this is kind of the democratic exuberance of the audience. So he knows about theater and there is something theatrical about this. Right? There is a sense in which this is a kind of soliloquy writ large and it has some of that kind of, or a, a series of soliloquies. So I think that's good. I think Whitman, whether you think of it as epic or music, opera or theater, there is the performative aspect of it, right? Epics that were meant to be performed. The written version of the Odyssey is just one version that we've gotten. Virgil's is different because he's invoking things for a written uh, context. But likewise, you know, theater and music, all of these are performances. And I think there's this aspect of performance that's definitely part of what Whitman's project is, foregrounded even more than we would say in, in um, some of the other poetry. I mean, you do get the, don't you get the sense if you're reading Brian Stanatopsis, it's not really meant to be performed. It's a kind of quiet meditation that you probably read to yourself. And certainly, Taylor's poetry are all personal, private meditations that weren't even really be meant to seen, be seen by anybody else. I think those are three very good things to bear in mind. Anything else that we might want to say about Whitman? One of the things, last things I would, I would suggest to you is that like both Emerson and Thoreau, Whitman is interested in a largeness that includes the possibility of self-contradiction. So I just wanted to point out one passage to you. This is at line 1323, towards the end of the poem. Or we can even go back to the beginning of that whole section there, section 51. The past and present wilt, I have filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. And again, I mean, there's a kind of weird thing that's going on there, right? I mean, Emerson says, you know, we got to tyrannize the past, make use of it. But what does it mean to make the past wilt and to be filling up the fold of the future? Listener up there. What have you to confide in me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly. No one else hears you, and I stay only a minute long. Right? It's clearly he's, in, he's constructing readers and listeners out there with which whom he is in dialogue. Do I contradict myself? And this is the line I wanted you to see. Very well, then. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Many things in me. But you could also read it, I contain multitudes. I keep them penned up, penned in. I mean, again, there's that, that, in that one word, there's the kind of, the sort of productive ambiguity that you would find in Whitman. There's something tyrann tyrannical about being the tyrannizing poetic eye, and yet maybe what we need is the tyrannizing poetic eye. Yeah? I think that's right. At the same time, the people who are many are all individually one thing. So there's that contradiction. I think that's great. I mean, I think one of the things that we would say about Whitman is that, at least this is the way that I tend to read Whitman, is that unlike Emerson, he takes up the kind of cosmopolitan opportunity that's there in the country. I said that, you know, Whitman liked to walk around the Lower East Side. He, he, he didn't find himself distressed by all the immigrants and the people that were coming to this country. You know, he works them into his poetry. Now, there's a sense in which you could say, you know, you could think about what the dynamics of this are. I mean, what did I say before about the melting pot? Everybody goes in, whatever they are, and they come out Presbyterian. Well, everybody, all the voices go into here, and they all come out Whitman, which you might say is true of Emerson, too. He's very eclectic in his rhetoric, and it all comes out sounding like Emerson. But I think, for me, there is a greater attention to difference and to bridging gaps um, and to the energies, you might say, of the city that kind of work their way into even the lines of the poetry that aren't about the city that I think of as, in some sense, deeply cosmopolitan in nature. And again, let me remind you, well, let me, let me let you hear this. All, all alike and do. Grow, ungrow, young or old, strong, ample, 
fair, enduring, capable, rich, perennial with the earth, with freedom, law, and love. That's for a wax cylinder recording, and it's believed by most scholars to be the only recording of Whitman that actually exists. So that's Whitman's voice when he's an older man in 1888. But again, there's that idea of being equal, equal daughters and equal sons, all, all alike, endeared, grown, ungrown, young or old, strong, ample, fair, enduring, capable, rich, perennial with the earth. Right? I mean, there's a sense in which Whitman wants to be is a couple of things, I think. One is a kind of cosmopolitan presence that's able to engage difference and appreciate people that are different from one another. And yet, he's also, I think, a poet of union. In some sense, he wants to bring all these people together. For me, the difference between Emerson and Whitman is that Emerson, wants to, Emerson is not interested in the details of other people's lives, in the, other, the details of the way in which people's experiences are different. He's not even interested in the details of his own bodily experience, at least not rhetorically. Whitman is. He's interested in all of the things that go into life. And he's trying to make them all part of experience that we can, we can um, appreciate. I mean, right, I mean, late in the poem, he talks about all these kind of secret thoughts and unvoiced things that people are afraid to say. And he wants them to come out in the open. So for me, Whitman is a lot adopts a, um, a kind of uh, perspective that we might really think of as cosmopolitan, right? This comes from David Hollinger, the intellectual historian from Berkeley, who talks about cosmopolitanism in opposition to multiculturalism, right? Multiculturalism is this idea of very separate traditions, African-American, Asian-American, women's writing, all these things separate. We, we say that they all count for something. They all have dignity, and we keep them separate. We don't want to make inroads from one discipline to another. We don't certainly want to tell somebody that we don't like their cultural practices. Cosmopolitans want to engage in conversation, among other things. They appreciate difference. Difference is not a problem for them. For someone like Emerson, whom I've called a universalist, difference is a problem, right? He solves it through the question of the soul. For multiculturalists, difference is also kind of a problem. I mean, we ostensibly appreciate difference, but we want to keep the people who are different, different. We don't like mixing if we're multiculturalists. We need to keep those African-American syllabi pure. We need to keep that Asian-American department running. You know, Whitman might say, let culture do what culture is going to do, which is going to be a lot of creating and groping and miscegenating. And, and I think um, Hollinger gets at some of that, too. Cosmopolitanism urges each individual and collective unit to absorb as much varied experience as it can while retaining its capacity to advance its aims effectively. I think that's a very good description of what Whitman is trying to do. His aims are democratic. And ultimately, you might say, his aim is to promote the idea of union, both literally in terms of the United States and metaphorically. Emerson is aware of the difference, right? The differences of people. He doesn't write about it so much in his own, um, in his own pieces. Um, but in his journal he does. In his continent, he writes in 1845, Asylum of all nations, the energy of Irish, Germans, Swedes, Poles, and the Cossacks, and all the European tribes of the Africans, the Polynesians, will construct a new race, a new religion, a new state, a new literature, which will be as vigorous as the new Europe which came out of the old smelting pot of the Dark Ages, or that which earlier emerged from the Pelasgic and Etruscan barbarism. Right? But this is hard for him. There's a, there's a kind of, there's a way in which, you know, at other moments, Emerson is bothered by what he thinks of as the kind of barbarism of some of these races, which he's not sure they can overcome. You, know. you can look for moments like that in Whitman, where Whitman seems to fall down on the job and is not as cosmopolitan as we like. But I think overall, Whitman is somebody who's pushing the envelope of what it is possible to think in the middle of the 19th century. And so he really is a poet. I think it's not accidental that much of his experience comes from the streets of New York. A poet who is able to appreciate difference and take different people on their own terms. But I do want to you know, suggest that Emerson is interested in this kind of commonality, right? He overstresses commonality, whereas I think Whitman is re you know, this idea of a universal mind. Right? I think Whitman is much more interested in a sense of, of diversity than that. We are a set of minds, and he's trying to bring them all together. 
Emerson is interested in creating something called universal history. Where, and I would ask you to think finally about the end of this poem and think about how this statement, right, about the generalizable nature of all private facts, what does that, how does that tell, what does that tell us um, about how to read Whitman, if anything? I mean, is Whitman at the end of Song of Myself deviating from this project? He's interested in timelessness, right? He's interested in trying to capture moments of local particular experience that are going to resonate. If you read Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, he articulates something that's clearly wrong. I mean, we don't have the same experience that he has. We don't cross the East River on the ferry very much anymore. We have other ways of going, subways and bridges and other things. But Whitman is asserting that there's something timeless about that experience, that he can connect to you because you're having essentially the same kind of experience even though it's going to differ in its local details. So look what he says here at the end of the poem. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering, right? I mean, he can poke fun at himself at the end of his large project. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. And I think that's a wonderful figure for what this poem is, right? The cry of the hawk, the barbaric yawp. Think about barbaric there in relation to this quote of Emerson's. We want to emerge from barbarism. That's the point for Emerson. Whitman wants, in some sense, to delight in barbarism, right? So I want to stress that, in a way, what Whitman is interested in is in the kind of barbaric nature of city experience and in what Tom Bender from the History Department has called the historic cosmopolitanism of New York, part of urban experience, right? So you see, what, think about what happens at the end of the poem as Whitman decides that he's finally, insofar as he has embodied the nation or, the nation or represented the nation, he's finally sort of gone into the very dirt and soil of the nation at the very end. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. And the grass for him is this great democratic figure, right? The leaf of grass, each one is special. Each one seems to be alike. You put them all together, you get a view. You need to step back, you see what a field looks like. But that doesn't keep him from appreciating the single leaf of grass either. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. And you know, Maybe that's a kind of, I don't know if it actually is, it's a kind of nod to Edward Taylor, right? I mean, tell her Edward Taylor is talking about how you're a crumb of dust. Well, Whitman, by the end, recedes into this kind of crumb of dust. He's going to be under your boot soles, in the earth itself. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless, and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. So there's a sense of, you know, there's a sense of time, but it's not quite the same idea as this universal time. And you should think for yourself about what it is. What's the difference between Emerson's universal history and this notion of history that Whitman is trying to evoke? Now, thinking about Union in the moment that he's writing this at first, 1855, is five years after the fugitive slave law, right? So you cannot think about Union without thinking about the problem of slavery in 1850, in New York and anywhere in the country in that moment, right? So that you might say that if I suggested to you that one of the subtexts or one of the cultural contexts that we need to keep in mind for a under full understanding of Whitman's poetry is the situation in the New York streets, the immigration in the aftermath of the Irish famine, you know, the crowding on the Lower East Side, the question of what it is that, um, what it is that, um, immigrants are going to do to this country, and I've said to you that Whitman embraces that change rather than resists it. Another crucial cultural context is the fugitive slave law and its aftermath. Right? So the fugitive slave law is part of a larger uh, pattern of, uh, of acts, you might say, or of, of congressional debates that finally brings the slavery question to a head. It had sort of started to become a problem in the national imagination with the onset of the Mexican-American War, right? And the Fugitive Slave Law becomes a part of this larger package of uh, legislation that becomes known as the Compromise of 1850 that was meant basically to keep the Union together, 
Right? That was the design. It was to keep the, the nation together from splitting off, to keep the South from seceding. And as I said, the part, of the part of the problem arose with the Mexican War, which was ended in 1848 by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and had a set of interesting consequences. Right? As a result of, or let's, let's, let's think back about before the Mexican War, what we have is um, a proposal in Congress from David Wilmot, who was a representative, called the Wilmot Proviso, which said that any territories that would be gained from a conflict with Mexico, which was already looming, would be free, period. No slavery in them. And this, was, this, was a, this caused a lot of heated debate in the course of the, of the beginning of the war, the lead up to war, and the, finally after the war itself. It was never passed. But one of the things you could see is that as a result of the Mexican War, a ton of new territory becomes part of the United States, which had previously been Mexico. It's now part of the United States, right? So all of this stuff over here, right? This is Mexico here. All of this stuff here is ceded to the United States from Mexico, right? So all of a sudden, the people living here are part of the United States. And many of them are, you know, had previously thought of themselves as Mexicans. And of course, they're promised equal rights as Americans, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't really happen. Um, Gadsden Purchase brings this. Texas has already been annexed by the United States in 1845. There's a whole bunch of new territory out here. And so the question is, is this stuff going to be slave or free? And it causes all these debates in the United States uh, Congress. The president um, at the time of all of this is Zachary Taylor, who is a, heary, a hero of the uh, Mexican War. And Taylor basically is... Um, somebody who wants to have both California and New Mexico admitted to the Union. That's one of the things he wants. But he wants it to be admitted as free states. Right? So this causes a big problem. Um, the aging Whig party leader, Henry Clay, offers a series of compromises. Right? So the Whigs, the, the political landscape is a little bit different. There is a Democratic Party. The Conservative Party tends to be the Whigs. The Republicans are just forming. And in the end, the Republicans become the main anti-slavery party, right, with Lincoln. At this moment, it's the Whigs who are sort of the uh, conservatives. And, they are in the, and Henry Clay is interested in a series of compromise um, resolutions that can be a kind of alternative to the Wilmot Proviso. So he proposes that California be admitted as a free state, but, he says, there should be no restriction on any of these other territories that are gained um, from Mexico. And he also proposes that a more stringent fugitive slave law be passed. Now, there's been a book, a fugitive, on the books, there's been a fugitive slave law that's been in effect since 1793, but it's a national law that's supposed to be enforced by the states. All right, so it doesn't have teeth. The states are supposed to enforce it. Some of the states have regulations prohibiting some, especially in the North, prohibiting any of their law enforcement people from enforcing that law. So Clay calls for a new law, one that's going to have federal marshals be the ones that are enforcing it. And this creates a this produces a series of debates, um, which are, you know, for students of congressional history, it's one of the prime moments for, for speechifying. John Calhoun, this old guy. He is the aging, I don't know what, he's kind of like a 19th century version of Strom Thurmond or something. Anybody remember Strom Thurmond? But he's a southerner, and he speaks against the compromise. And this is what he's worried about. He's worried about the fact that if these states are allowed to come, any states are allowed to come in as free, what will happen is that there will be a numerical majority of states that are free in the Senate, and because the South's population is bounded by its territory and will not grow, there will also be a majority in the House of Representatives, which is based on population. As a result, he believes that the inevitable tide is going to be turning against the South. There will be a tyrannical northern majority. And eventually, he thinks it's inevitable that slavery will be abolished. And therefore, the South's way of life will be completely destroyed. So, he says, if these measures pass, the South will, in order to preserve itself, its civilization, will have to secede from the Union. There can be no, you know, compromise without secession. Okay. 
Into this fray steps Daniel Webster, who, features, who is featured in Emerson's address on the Fugitive Slave Law. Webster is a senator from Massachusetts, which is a state that's opposed to slavery. And he gives a famous reply to Calhoun in which he says, there is no such thing as a peaceable secession. You secede, we go to war. Webster doesn't want that. Pretty much nobody wants that. So Webster had opposed the Mexican War. He wasn't an imperialist. He had supported the Wilmot Proviso, but he feared the possibility of disunion even more than he disliked slavery. He really feared civil war. As a, as a, so he sides with Clay and pleads for the compromise of 1850 and for what he calls a charitable spirit towards the South. Because in fact, he does agree with certain Southern complaints that, that they have about the way that abolitionists have been portraying their society. He also supports Clay's demand for a stringent fugitive slave law. But there's a kind of pragmatic bent to his, his thinking. He thinks, look, the Western territories are radically different in climate from the South. The South's climate is conducive to crops like tobacco and cotton that need kind of workers like slaves to pick them and produce, the, you know, produce those raw materials. Not, not going to be true in the West, he says. Not going to be true in California. It's basically a moot point. Those will never become slave cultures in the way that the South has. So why would we break up the Union now over what is practically a theoretical point? Okay. In the midst of all this, Taylor dies. He doesn't stay in office very long. And he's succeeded by... <coughs> he's succeeded by... He succeeded by... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> never, never, never good to be 13th. They always forget you. Um, he's a buddy of Clay's, and he sides with Clay's, and the, comp and the compromise passes. Okay? So that is what Emerson is writing about. And in its final form, the Compromise of 1850 contains four provisions that should concern us because they're related to slavery. Right? It's a big omnibus bill. We're familiar with those these days. We've always been. Um, first one is California is admitted as a free state. The rest of the Mexican session is um, organized into two territories, which are called New Mexico and Utah, with no federal restrictions on slavery. They can do what they want later on. The slave trade, but not slavery, is prohibited in the nation's capital. And there is a stringent fugitive slave law. In addition to requiring that the northern states capture and return slaves to their owners in the south, the law even goes further and deprives blacks of jury trial or the right to testify in their bone own defense. Right? It really sucks. And it gets people in the north absolutely outraged. What they start to realize is they can't sit by any longer, that now Massachusetts is party to slavery. Of course, this is something that's always been true. This is part of what Harriet Beecher Stowe will demonstrate, will try to dramatize for us, that it's a, it's a national economy. The South was never exempted from benefiting from the slave trade insofar as it bought raw materials or was just even part of the same national system. But now what, what's come home to these people is that they are by law required to abet the slave catchers. Everyone in the North now becomes a slave catcher. This, um, and, and there are other things. I mean, yeah, the slave trade goes on in District of Columbia, and even California has slavery. Indians are enslaved in California, right? So it's very, it's full of problems. It doesn't actually solve anything. And you might argue that the Compromise of 1850 makes civil war inevitable rather than preventing it. It just takes a little bit of, of time. It creates a kind of veneer of peace, but one that isn't going to last. The Fugitive Slave Law is tested right away in Massachusetts. A slave named Thomas Sims is, is there, and um, he's captured, and then the, there's a restraining order, and it goes to trial. And the Chief Justice of Massachusetts um, returns Sims to his owners in the South. Does anybody happen to know who the Chief Justice of Massachusetts was in that moment? This guy, Lemuel Shaw, anti-slavery guy, but he supports the Constitution. Fugitive slave law is the law of the land. He has to find it. He doesn't find it unconstitutional. Do you know who this guy is? 
He has a famous son-in-law. No, his son-in-law has a different name. He has a son-in-law has a different name. It's Herman Melville. We'll talk about this again. But, you know, insofar as context is everything, context slavery is not something that is simply an abstract thing for Melville. His father-in-law rules on what is arguably the biggest slave case um, to date. And um, Melville is somebody who is aware of his father-in-law's cases. The term monomania, which figures largely in, um, in Melville's descriptions of Ahab, or Ishmael's descriptions of Ahab, it comes from one of Shaw's cases. We'll get to that. I just want to strike that note now. Don't forget it. Okay. Um, Emerson is particularly bitter about this, right? And we go back to thinking about the American scholar, right? Remember what he says there, that men in history are bugs, are spawn. All of them behold in the hero or the poet their own greed and crude being and are willing to be less, are content to be less, so that may attain its full stature. Later on in his writings, he goes on to develop the concept of what he calls the representative man, somebody who embodies self-reliance kind of hero. He wishes that we were all representative men. One of these representative men is Daniel Webster. I mean, Webster, you might say, is one of Emerson's culture heroes, which was why it is particularly disappointing for Emerson to uh, see Webster support this compromise and this fugitive slave law. And if you have a the copy of the, the essay, you might bring it out now, although I'll put some of it on the screen. And I want you to, to look at the way it begins. Right? This is the second version of this address. Shortly after 1850, I mean, I think the first of these addresses in 1851, Emerson decides he has to speak out on this question, right? So Emerson, who has wanted to be aloof from particular public questions, political questions, he wants to write a philosophy that's universal in some way, finds that he can't do that in good conscience anymore. Slavery is something different. And this fugitive slave law has implicated everyone, and he has a moral duty, he believes, to speak out against it. Right? I do not often speak to public questions. They are odious and hurtful, and it seems like meddling or leaving your work. I have my own spirits in prison, spirits in deeper prisons whom no man visits if I do not. And then I see what havoc it makes with any good mind, this dissipated philanthropy. But he has to do it. Anyway, let's turn a page and a little bit further on. Go to page 76, when he actually gets into the swing of things and starts talking about Webster. This is about, it's, and it's the quote that's up on the, um, up on the board. He's thinking about an appearance where he saw Webster speaking at Bunker Hill. And he says, there was the monument, and here was Webster. He knew well that a little more or less of rhetoric signified nothing. He was only to say plain and equal things, grand things if he had them, and if he had them, not only to abstain from saying unfit things. And the whole occasion was answered by his presence. It was a place for behavior, much more than for speech, and Webster walked through his part with entire success. Right? Webster, culture hero. And he goes on. He's a good speaker, right? His wonderful organization, Emerson writes, the perfection of his elocution and all that thereto belongs, voice, accent, intonation, attitude, manner, we shall not soon find again. Then he was so thoroughly simple and wise in his rhetoric, he saw through his matter, hugged his fact so close, went to the principal or essential, and never indulged in a weak flourish though he knew perfectly well how to make such exordiums, episodes, and perorations as might give perspective to his harangue without in the least embarrassing his march or confounding his transitions. In his statement, things lay in daylight. We saw them in order as they were, right? And think about the things that, that Emerson has said in The American Scholar about man thinking, right? Webster is man thinking. We're watching thinking in action in contrast to the cynic dogic man, right? The partial man in the divided or social state. Or think about Thoreau's talking about little statesmen and divines who can't get back and see the larger picture. Webster was not that. Webster was a big statesman. He was able to see things. And you think about Emerson's belief that a true theory will be its own evidence, right? It'll explain all things. There's something, there's a resonance of that here. We saw things in order as they were, he says. Though he knew very well on occasion how to present his own personal claims, yet in his argument he was intellectual, right? It's no mean egotism that's going to be here. 
stated as fact pure of all personality, so that his splendid wrath when his eyes became lamps was the wrath of the fact and the cause he stood for. His power, like that of all great masters, was not in excellent parts. Again, think of the, what Emerson says in American Scholar, but total. He's the total guy. All the parts are coming together. He had a great and everywhere equal propriety. He worked with that closeness of adhesion to the matter in hand which a joiner or chemist uses, and the same quiet and sure feeling of right to his place that an oak or a mountain have to theirs. Right? Webster is almost a kind of force of nature. Right? Think about that. The goal of nature, stating, defining a true theory that's its own evidence. Emerson says that Webster seems to have that kind of rhetorical power. He can make his argument seem self-evident. Um, and Emerson, you know, I, I, I don't know how where Emerson is of this, but we cris criticize Emerson frequently for being, nevertheless, despite what he says, a kind of fragmentary thinker, somebody who's assembled things, but maybe they don't all go together. There's all that kind of leaping of thought and those contradictory moments. That's not what we find here in Webster, right? Webster creates a sum total which has a certain kind of propriety. So far, so good. But it turns out, and this is what Emerson is going to argue here, is that Webster has a fatal flaw, despite all of this. A flaw in what we might think of as his kind of moral sensibility. And as the essay goes on a little bit, you might say, Webster seems like somebody who, uh, well, Webster seems like somebody who emerges as a kind of anti-Emerson, or he, has, he lacks certain things that Emerson has, right? He seemed born, so he goes on, he seemed born for the bar, this is the bottom of 76, born for the Senate and took very naturally a leading part in large private and public affairs, for his head distributed things in their right places and what he saw so well he compelled other people to see also. <laughs> ah, great is the privilege of eloquence, right? There's something of that tyrannous eye as well, but the flaw comes in. And Emerson goes on to say that the history of this country has given a disastrous importance to the defects of this great man's mind. And we're going to talk about those, whether in evil influences and the corruption of politics or whether original infirmity, it was the misfortune of this country that with this large understanding, he had not what is better than intellect and the essential source of its health. It is the office of the moral nature to give sanity and right direction in the mind, to give centrality and uniform. And I want you to go back and think again, to map this back onto the end of nature, right? The ideal philosophy, however smart it might make us, is not enough. It leaves us in the labyrinth of our own perceptions, right? We need something else. There, it's kind of a spirituality, right? So the spirit is the thing that we're after, not just idealism. There's a sense in which what Webster is lacking is a certain kind of spirituality. That's one thing. Another thing is what Emerson goes on to call a kind of sterility of thought, right? So he says, like, though the whole thing is nice and it has an equal priority, right? We are compelled. It's almost like Emerson says, you know, when I think about it, he didn't say anything that was really that great. No aphorisms. The sterility of thought, the want of generalization in his speeches, and the curious fact that with a general ability that impresses all the world, there is not a single general mark, not an observation on life and manners that can, not a single valuable aphorism that can pass into literature from his writings. And who, of course, is the master of the aphorism of Maxim, if not Emerson, right? I mean, just go back to that Reebok commercial, just lay them all out there. Whoso will be a man must be a nonconformist. Speak your latent thought and it will prove, you know, just that's what Emerson is really good at. Webster isn't. And I think the essay is making a kind of connection. There's a way that we understand a kind of flaw in, in the moral nature by understanding this inability to synthesize or to generalize and distill things down to their essence. And you might say that's what Emerson's philosophy is all about in the end, distilling things down to their essence and finding in that essence self-reliance. Right? So that would be another way, that would be the way that Emerson would think about what I've called his universalism. Webster is unable to do that, and therefore, in the crucial moment when his mor moral sensibility is needed most, it fails him. If any man, Emerson says, had in that hour possessed the weight with the country which he had acquired, he could have brought the whole country to its senses. But he doesn't. So one of the things we might say about the Fugitive Slave Law Address is that it really is, in a certain way, um, a lot like 
and this is Webster later on. Looks like a colleague of mine in the English department. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't say that. Um, he, he has a certain kind of, you, know, you might say that Webster has a certain kind of flaw which if we follow the logic of Emerson had thought of him as a kind of representative man, right? Somebody who sums up the country becomes a kind of national flaw. We have a morally defective nature as our country. So you might say, what I want to suggest to you, therefore, is that there are two ways to think of, there are two different moments in Emerson's writing that we've looked at where he is testing his philosophy of self-reliance. I've already talked to you about one of them, which is experience, right? Can we maintain our belief in the need for self-reliance in the aftermath of the most terrible grief? And I've suggested that what Emerson discovers to his chagrin, maybe even, even to his horror, is that yes, we can. We lose our son to a certain extent. It's a tragedy, but we are left fundamentally unchanged. And he pulls himself up by his bootstraps, so that even among the most bleak of these rocks, there's God there, and it gives him hope for the future. This, you might say, is a testing on the largest cultural grounds. And what we might say is that Emerson finds at the end of this episode that the country really should listen to him, that the country is lacking in self-reliance, at least insofar as it is embodied in somebody like, um, somebody like um, Webster, right? Does, Emerson, does Webster go for what he knows to be right? Is he self-reliant? No. Webster goes for compromise. And for Emerson, that is a cultural disaster. Okay? Next time, we will start to explore. For next week, we will start to explore what, that, what the dimensions of that cultural disaster are. Right? That thing that's left unsolved from the Declaration of Independence, that thing called slavery. All right. Thanks a lot.